I'll just hit the recording button here in case anybody finds a good reason to return to this. Uh, awesome. First of all, welcome, a warm welcome to all of you. And I wanna, I wanna start out by doing a round of introductions and it's going to be a super short introduction from each of you and from myself. And I'm just sharing my screen here, just because I can. That's why I have Facebook here. <laughs> I can. <laughs> so uh, I want everybody to introduce themselves just by introducing yourself by name and your personal massive transformative purpose. And I, I, for, for some, this is a given. For some, this may be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, either way is fine. Uh, I, I, I just like to initiate a, a, a thinking process around, you know, how can I improve my own personal MTP? I hope you're doing the same thing. So let's do a round of introductions. Everybody says hi, you know, and your name and your personal MTP. And then we'll move on from, from there. And I have, I have Emily at the top of my screen here. So Emily, would, would you love to go first? No, you would not like to go first. That's totally fine. <laughs> Let's let me. That's absolutely fine. Let's see. I can go first, Lars. No I'll go first. Perfect. Perfect. Oh. Matthew, you, were, you, were you first? Yeah. Okay, so my name is Marcio Scher. I'm from Brazil. I live in the U.S. in Miami, and my company name is Go Growth. And our MTP is not my personal M M MTP, but it's my company MTP. It's uh, we are bridging the gap between companies and digital transformation. Wonderful. Well, welcome to the call, Matthew. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Nice to see you. And who, who this is Fernando Cruz. Hey, Fernando. And uh, my personal MTP is helping companies and those around me positively impact the world. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. We need it very much, Fernando. Welcome to the call. <laughs> Good to have you here. Thanks, Lars. Kevin, uh, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Kevin Allen. I'm phoning in from Cape Town, South Africa, and my personal MTP is transforming mindsets to abundance. Wonderful. Just what we need. Good to have you, Kevin. I hope you found your parking lot. <clears throat> so, uh, Wonderful. Who's next? I'll go next. It's Jabin Kadir, and my personal MTP is exponential sustainable pro exponential prosperity for all. I'm still working on it. Hello? Hi, this is Suma. Can I go next? Yeah, I've, I've lost everybody else. Okay. Uh, I thought I was the only one. Yeah, the audio just yeah, went no, back. I, 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 okay. I think we're back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, I think, yeah. Thank you, okay. for, thank you for having patience with me here and my Wi-Fi. Uh, so um, yeah, I was about to say I'm, I'm next, uh, uh, and then we'll check in with uh, Emily in just a moment to see if she's, she's uh, available. Uh, my, I'm Lars, and my personal MTP is resourcefulness for breakthroughs in every individual and team. That's me. Uh, resourcefulness is super interesting for me, and that's my connection to coaching, which is the topic for the call today. So, um, I wanted to hear yeah, if, if Emily, if we have Fabian. Hey, hi everyone. This is Fabian from Mexico. And my personal MTP is to transform people and organizations. Wonderful. 
sounds spot on and it's ex i'm very excited to have you here so thank you, thank you very much uh henrik have you introduced yourself <clears throat> here i go i just need to unmute so uh, my name is henrik Bo Larsen, and my personal mpt is uh, unlocking potential in Wonderful. Thank you very much for being here, Henrik, and I look forward to hear more about that a little bit later in the call. Uh, Emily, are you um, are you okay to say hi now? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Hi, I'm Emily Sydney Smith, and I did something really silly, which was change my MTP about a month ago, write it down, and now I can't find it. Which means clearly it was not a strong enough MTP that it didn't go into the head. So I need to deal with that. No problem. <clears throat> no problem. But I think it's amazing that, that you're iterating the MTP. And I, I think that's uh, it's an important lesson, right, for, for everyone. It's not something you have to nail right here and right now. It's something that keeps evolving probably. Um, so great, great to have your example here. Uh, of an MTP evolving. Awesome. Just checking. Is anyone here who hasn't introduced themselves? It is recorded. Hi, um, Hi this is Suman from India. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Suman from Bangalore in India. And uh, my MTP is uh, actually help uh, corporates not just to look digital, but to act digital. And I'm a leadership consultant. I help uh, mentor startups and coach corporate leaders to make sure they are embracing the essence of digital to leverage uh, their exponential journey. That's amazing. And you're sitting in the heart of a very interesting market that really needs you. This is, uh, this is super exciting. And I'm very pleased to Love. have you on. Oh, Lars, yes. I'm sorry. So uh, I apologize to interrupt, but because of the snafu with the with your video or whatever, it, it stopped. Um, uh, it stopped recording. It says here it's still recording. Actually, is it? Uh, okay. Yeah, it is okay. recording. Thank you. Thank okay, you good. very much. Okay. Yeah. Fabian was it's, asking. Okay. Yeah, but thank you very much for for bringing it up. It's a cloud recording, and they seem to continue. And I can see here it is recording. So, all good, all good. And uh, Suman, uh, as I said, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I look very much forward to uh, to get to know all to you uh, better. Okay. And <clears throat> and then I wanted to check again. Have we heard? I I see Mark on the call. Hey, Mark, have you introduced yourself? Hi, good morning from Palo Alto. I'm Mark Bonavia, and my MTP is Boost Abundance Mindset. Woohoo! Exactly, exactly what this is all about, Mark, today. So uh, excellent to have you here. And we have, um, we have Mike. Hey, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> Awesome. <clears throat> let me uh, let me let me talk a little bit about um, the EXO Lever ecosystem be before we dive right into today's topic. Uh, and I'm I'm showing here a, a pretty busy slide, <clears throat> but, but essentially, is it? Uh, hey, Mark, is that you? <laughs> Uh, I think my, Mike Lingle is having some connection challenges. Okay, let's let's carry on here. I, I was saying welcome in the beginning. I want to say welcome again because you're all part of what we call our family, right? It's uh, either the second or, or the first family for some maybe. It's a very important ecosystem for all of us. And, and you see here a lot of information about, first of all, um, our MTP, our global transformation ecosystem, and how we are helping organizations and people to unlock abundance. You see on the left-hand side, a lot of the topics that you guys uh, cover, we guys, girls cover all together as an ecosystem. 
uh, and some statements in the middle. And when, when, uh, when we come together to deliver different sprints, or workshops around the world, when I, when I talk to you guys, uh, I'm asking, you know, why are you doing this? Right? And we all have a lot of shared interest and we can hear that when we are presenting our personal MTPs. So that's one part of it. And we enjoy working with the different clients that we work with. But one of the key factors I keep hearing from, from you that, and the reason why we're doing this very often is because of we have the chance to get together. We have to meet, uh, we get to meet each other and spend some time together. And we've been doing that, uh, many of us, for a long time now and enjoying coming together, spending time together, discussing all sorts of topics. I just wanted to say first, before we uh, start on today's topic, that the call today is more than about coaching. It's also an ecosystem get together, right? It's, a, it's an opportunity to spend a bit of time together. And we wanna do more of these calls, depending on the topic. If you're interested in a topic, you can jump on and join us, please do. If, if you need to prioritize something else, it's also fine. You can jump on another call another day on another topic. Uh, so I just wanted to say to all of you, welcome to this, uh, to our family, to our ecosystem, our movement. You are very important and, uh, and we are all here for each other. I wanted to, um, also point out one specific thing on this slide. Uh, the words exponential thinking and the words exponential thinking is what I very much think is what coaching is about. Coaching is a way for us to, to boost the exponential thinking, to help us think in new ways, see things from different perspectives and hopefully exponentially applying exponential attributes and think very different from what we used to do. So exponential thinking is the single one sentence or part of the sentence from this slide that I want just you, and that you keep in mind. And we'll get back to that later on this call. So now I have the next little challenge for all of you. <laughs> and I want you all to chip in here, <clears throat> just like you just did uh, when saying hello and your MTP. I have a question for each of you. And I want each of you to answer this in your own way, with your own words. I want you all to present to us what is your definition of successful coaching and sell your story to us, right? <laughs> Give it your best shot. What is your own definition of successful coaching? There's no right or wrong here. I, I would like to learn what your definition is of successful coaching. And I have prepared here so I can write down your definitions, for each of you. So collectively, we get a lot of suggestions to what, what does this mean to, to each of us. So I'm, going out of, uh, I'm going out of my sharing mode here, screen sharing mode, so we can better see each other. And I hope, I hope you guys have the chance to, um, to use video if you feel like it, um, but at least you have the chance to jump into the chat box now and see the question again that I was just asking. So now we, are, we can see each other better and, and you have the question here, establish your definition of successful coaching and sell your story to us. And now the question is who, who would love to go first? What's your definition of successful coaching? I see Fabian. I'll, I'll go. Yep. I'll go. Um, awesome. Thank you, Fabian. I, I think successful coaching is about helping others finding the answers. So guiding them to find those truths within them or within their uh, ecosystem or uh, organization. Beautiful. Helping others finding the answers. Cool. And feel free to contribute in the chat room here, anyone, right? 
comments or uh, also your definitions. I, I like this. Thank you very much, Fabian. Other other thoughts on uh, successful coaching, Fernando? Yeah, this is Suman. And, Suman. Uh, yeah, my thoughts are a good coaching from the perspective of a coach. That's me. It's about uh, the coachy is going to come to me back again without any compulsion or without there is any formal need. So, so that's that's the first this thing that I need to establish with the coachy that without any compulsion that there is an urge that I'm able to build to come back to me again and again. That's number one. And number two, from my perspective as a good coach, I am going to pose questions to his or her situations and not give him answers by way of asking good questions so that he herself comes out with an answer. So my my uh, ability to offer the perspective first and then ask the right questions is my idea of a good coach. Or could you swap that around talking about us? You're asking good questions to, to kind of bring other perspectives to the surface kind of. Correct. I mean, ask questions so that he himself sees the wider perspective yeah. and comes up with an answer or a solution so that he or she has a buy-in into the solution much better and is a much stronger, you know, approach to, you know, uh, leading into the future rather than me offering the solution myself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Awesome. That's great. Can I go, Lars? Uh, yes, please. Well, I, I agree with both Fabian and both Suma, but I think... Also, uh, the role of the coaching is to provoke uh, uh, the people. I think we are part of an extraordinary group that has access to tons of information, tons of new stuff. And I think most of the people don't have access to the kind of information that we have. So I think that our first role is basically to, to show them what's the new world, what's, what's the new structure that we all have agreed that is going to be in five, 10, 20 years. So we, we need to provoke them. And, and then I agree with Fabian and then help them uh, 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 ask the right questions or find the right answer. And at the same time, unlocking the, let's say, the hidden creativity and the hidden uh, 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 answer uh, that they might have and they might know, don't know that they have. So I mm -hmm. think our role is first to provoke because we are dealing with very <laughs> traditional companies. I mean, after all, what we're selling is our sprint, is our knowledge. So we need to provoke them, say, hey, your business is no longer sustainable. Your, your, your margins are, are, are going down. You're going to be disruptive. We need to, to show them the, the raw reality and then help them to unlock the answers, not by themselves, but with our help. I mean, we need to, we, we need to be the guides, but we need to provoke them all the time because we, if we don't provoke them, they're going to see us just, you know, some kind of a guru or some kind of a magician that's very far away of, them, uh, of their reality. So I think we need to provoke them. We need to attack them in a good way. <laughs> oh. So I'm going to take the more generalist approach uh, to coaching is, but uh, I think it's really to bring out the best in, in either the person, if you're coaching individually or, or the team or the group, if it's, if you're, if you're coaching a team, whether that's in our EXO sprints or on the, on the hockey, uh, on the hockey ice as uh, the, the uh, NHL is starting now. And it's important whether, you know, if it's a, it's, if it's a person, it's about bringing out their skills and attitude and, and for groups, it's about how they can work together because you might have a bunch of brilliant people, but uh, you need to coach them to, to actually work together in a co cohesive way. And, and motivation is a big part about coaching too, right? Getting people to really get involved and so forth. Yeah. Motivation. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Fernando. Emily? Uh, so I think it's also about changing the usual fight or flight instinct that people have around change mm. <clears throat> and turning that into inspiration and motivation along with having the skills to actually change the metabolism of the company to change. 
Um, and I really like what um, Fernando just said because it kind of leads into the EXO attributes, you know, things like autonomy. So it's actually experiencing autonomy um, for the first time often. Um, and often also experiencing their competence for the first time. You know, often people work in a very small um, niche of what they do and suddenly they have this sort of blossoming, which is wonderful mm -hmm. to see. And, and that blossoming is, is exactly why I do what I do. <laughs> I'm sure the reason why you guys do what you do as well, that's, it, is a, it is amazing. Hey, Peter? Yes, hi everyone. Sorry for joining late a little bit. So I had a very nice uh, coaching experience in last uh, spring when my daughter learned uh, how to bike, how to ride the, uh, a bicycle. And uh, so I, I, I also know, but it was uh, sometimes very, very difficult to, to, to I don't, teaching is not the best word for it, uh, but uh, to uh, so somehow to um, motiv motivate and uh, and also keep <laughs> keep his uh, in, in, uh, her impressions uh, in, in in the right manner. Uh, so it it was very very difficult for me because she's uh, my first uh, kid, and uh, but. It, it was something very, very special. So I, I couldn't tell her how to ride the bike, but how, how uh, to, to react on when she was feeling the, the, the fall or what happened after uh, it happened, uh, it, uh, after she fell with the yeah. bike. And um, so th this was something very, very uh, special. And I, I think we have to do something similar with clients when they are looking for yeah. solutions, uh, but they don't uh, see how they can achieve uh, that one, just that they, that they see that, okay, I want to learn how to ride the bicycle. I think it's a very good point, right? The road to success includes so many failures, right? So, and as a coach, you yeah. get to, to experience the pain of every one of those failures, uh, but hopefully you will also be there when the breakthrough happens, like the like your daughter who learned to ride the bicycle, suddenly, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly the breakthrough is there, right? yes. and that's the pain of all the hard work. <laughs> and in, in in many cases, when when she f uh, fell, then uh, he then she told me that okay, it's because of me, <laughs> oh, <laughs> because yeah. you are not you are not a good father, yeah. and, and and so on. So she was even using such kind of words. <laughs> <laughs> You you will get to experience that in 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 a, in a sprint or in a coaching yes. situation in a sprint. I'm sure many of you yeah. have had that experience, right? That people come to thank you personally for 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 being part of uh, some breakthroughs and uh, some some learning there. Yeah, absolutely. A any other thoughts? Yeah, maybe I can just add to that uh, because I was kind of inspired by Peter's comment. Um, I, I I also have a quite broad general understanding of of a, a successful coaching. First of all, I'm st still you know focused on this about unlocking the potential, and I think that's that's a good headline for the whole coaching. How uh, do you then do that? I mean, first of all, you need to help the client or the individual or the organization to understand the problem, understand the situation, and this is about asking a question and examining this in a broad sense is, is a very a very helpful intervention, help to see possibilities and also to have the client to take responsibility of the role so they don't play the, the victim card that I'm kind of victim to the situation. So, so kind of change or broaden that perspective of the client is a very, uh, effective coaching and then finally understand have the clients understand how they can impact the situation uh, with those strengths they have discovered during the coaching wow that's a lot of great stuff here henry I'm trying to yeah yes uh, just a question how would you characterize the differences between coaching and mentoring mm -hmm. for for me it's kind of um, merging 
because you know depending on the situation uh, depending on the people you are dealing with you need to to use very different uh, tactics to be successful so i mean for me that's no clear definition it's it's bent together can i can i add something here this is mike because uh, I do a lot of mentoring and coaching and someone finally explained to me the difference. Uh, and it's helped my mental model a lot when I'm working with people. So in mentoring, usually I've been there before and I'm explaining my experience. And in coaching, I haven't necessarily been there before and or I'm letting people draw their own conclusions. So it's more about drawing something out of the person than something that I have direct experience with. Uh, cause I've run a few accelerator programs and that, that mental model has actually helped me a lot. Cause the second, I don't know the answer. I switch into like, uh, into that coaching mode where I can draw things out. Or if I don't want to give the answer, I can intentionally switch into that mode. That's excellent. Peter. Uh, just making a comparison between coaching and mentoring. So, and bringing an example for basketball. So, if you want to be a, a good a basketball coach, you don't necessarily need to be a, a professional player. But if you want to be a mentor, then I think you should, you you have to be because then you need all 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 the knowledge the person you are mentoring needs to know. But uh, coaching is, is something uh, different. Just uh, you have to show them the. The, the quickest uh, way to, to being, for example, successful or how to uh, improve the, the person, him or herself. Just showing, showing the, the, the way towards being a professional, but not having the, the, the exact knowledge about the tricks and tips of, uh, of, of playing basketball. I see several nodding. I also see Emily uh, indicating. <laughs> Um, I was thinking of two other things, which is, um, first of all, I think one of the skills that uh, people who are being coached get most is um, the ability to go and customer validate, which they often haven't had before. And so that sort of ability to go and tr do true due diligence into an idea is kind of where we're going. And so sort of, uh, to me, teaching people how to do that for themselves is really important. Um, the other aspect, just thinking about what Mike just said, is that I think in many ways as coaches, we see patterns and that allows us to actually almost summarize for people what their often very chaotic thoughts are and sort of pull the, um, the gems out of it. And I think that is an important part of the coaching. I can add uh, my two cents. Uh, I do both. When I do mentoring, typically I say I mentor this startup. When I do coaching, I say I coach X or Y or Z. So coaching is more intimate, more individualistic, more personal. Whereas mentoring is more, uh, you know, it's uh, like a, I mentor a startup. I, I very seldom say that I mentor an individual. And in that startup, I end up mentoring a bunch of folks, not just the founder and co-founder, but the whole bunch of folks just to make sure that the startup becomes a success. So it's a, it's a little more individual versus more, uh, you know, object driven is my essential difference. Excellent. <clears throat> I, I think there's a lot of alignment between the different ways we frame this. Uh, so so that, that's great. A anyone who sees it differently, because we, we, we can all learn. <clears throat> I, I, I personally see mentoring as someone who has walked in those shoes before, someone who has tried it, the experienced entrepreneur or the experienced business leader or whatever, or basketball player that can actually show you and say, I've, I've been there. I went through that pain and this is how I solved it. The, the solution for you may be different, but this is how it played out for me, right? That's what a mentor can say uh, in a convincing way with a lot of good reasons for saying things. The coach, on the other hand, like someone said earlier, it doesn't necessarily have to have tried this before. <clears throat> it, it, it might it might help if, if you have. But as a coach, uh, you are relying on typically on certain frameworks or methodologies to achieve what you need to achieve with your coaching 
inter interventions, which is typically something about, have you considered enough options here? How do you feel about the decision you're about to make? ask questions, right? I've never played basketball maybe, but I could still coach a basketball player, I think. Um, so so, so I, I see some clear differences for sure. And, and <clears throat> but, but I think it's a very interesting conversation because most, most people I meet don't really distinguish. They're, they're hoping to get some help and they see you right in front of them. And then they, they ask us, what is the right solution here, right? If we are consultant in that particular space, or if we are the basketball coach and it's a basketball player asking, we are in a good position here to, to answer the question. If we are coach, we shouldn't even try to answer the question, right? We, we should start to steer the conversation in, in, in a different way, in another way as a coach so and and i think it's very per, personally I, I i try to set these expectations before an intervention right what is my role in this uh, maybe i'm a consultant because i i know about this industry and i i probably can help out uh, on a solution then i'll tell tell the coachee or the client if if i want to coach I should say that, right? I should say, I'm here as a coach. This is what you can expect from me. Or even I could be your mentor on this because I've done exactly this. And I think people will appreciate that, that we are being clear about what is my role, regardless which of these roles that I take on. So I think it's a very interesting conversation here. Was that of any inspiration to anyone? <laughs> anyone wants to chip in next? Either uh, that, that might not uh, necessarily be the case. I, I, I have I have uh, a little bit of material I could I could share here, and then we could uh, take the next step into this conversation around around coaching. Uh, I think it's very aligned with what we have talked about. So. Let me uh, let me here just bring up my screen again. There we go. Just trying to share my screen here again. Um, so recently, I captured uh, this tweet from Harvard Business Review stating that just 21% of board directors think that technology trends are a major strategy challenge for their firms, right? Which is shocking in my personal opinion. And Selim responded, this is why major corporations are an existential threat, right? And I put, I put an arrow on this screen here uh, next to the word think, right? Because that, that's, that's where the challenge always is, right? It's our, our mindset, our way of thinking. That is the challenge. If, if, if we could see things coming, <laughs> if, then, then the, the technology trends wouldn't be such a challenge to us, right? But our, our way of thinking, our way of seeing things is the challenge, is our limitation, right? And I think as a coach, we, we have a, a, an obligation, also a wonderful opportunity to challenge the way we think, challenge the way our client thinks and also challenge each other because we all have the same challenge. Which <laughs> Are we thinking? Is law stuck? I think so. Yes. <laughs> we, we, lost, we lost him. <laughs> oh. I'm back again. I'm back. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm back. Uh, it's my Wi Fi here. I'm paying for it and I'm certainly not getting it. So, But I am still recording. Just checking. I'm still recording. Mm. 
So, so challenging each other's mindsets and actually transforming mindset is what we do. And that's why the coaching approach is, is, is so important. So I, I just wanted to bring up here a couple of very standard definitions I've just found on the web, right? On Wikipedia and other places, just to have that conversation uh, around how, 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 how do we define coaching if we look on the internet? So one of, uh, one of the, the key definitions, which I actually enjoy very much is this one, that coaching is helping someone to unlock their personal potential. I, I love that statement. It's, it's everywhere on the internet and there are many other variants of this definition. I like them all pretty much, but this is my favorite because it talks about the personal potential. And I keep reminding myself and others that when we run a sprint, which involves a lot of people in an organization, we are not transforming the whole organization overnight. Uh, we are actually transforming individuals first, in my opinion. We are, we are transforming one person at a time, maybe, hopefully several at the same time. But those individuals will be the ones suddenly seeing things in a new way and then they will help to challenge the rest of us in thinking differently and as as this starts to spread a group can start a, a transformation of mindset and then groups can spread this out to larger organizations right so i think this starts with the individual always and then the larger the organization the more the more work we need to do to, to spread this out, spread this mindset. Uh, and everybody needs to be part of doing that. It's like growing our own ecosystem, right? And you guys are here because you have similar mindsets. That's wonderful. That's what our clients are trying to build as well. And we are here to help them on that. So I like the, the, the personal level very much. And we have the opportunity as coaches to work with small groups of people to achieve this. And it's so enriching. It's, it's just wonderful when, when it happens and when it plays out nice and people get their breakthroughs and they, wow, I can see it now. I can see it differently, right? All of you, many of you have had this experience. So I just wanted also to kind of rework this definition a little bit, maybe for our exponential use so i've been playing a little bit i couldn't sleep last night it's, it's a joke but <laughs> but i did do this last night so i'm kind of what if we for the sake of this little exercise replace personal potential with exponential thinking it's it's both i think but coaching is helping someone to unlock the exponential thinking maybe that could be fun right uh, maybe that could be an interesting definition if that's our main goal with an intervention, either a one-off or 10 weeks of interventions, that's, I think that's interesting. So maybe, maybe EXO coaching is helping someone to unlock their exponential thinking. I don't know, uh, but in, in, in my world, that's how I see it a little bit. A any, any thoughts on that? Any feedback on that? Sounds good. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the whole point, is it not? That uh, essentially, you know, there's, there, there's so many people whose who's, who's thinking is, you know, is very linear, very uh, scarcity sort of focused and being, and being able to give people you know, to really open up that ability to think exponentially and to see things in a different way is, is so amazing. And, and that's what you see, sort of light bulbs switching on. Um, but it is a matter of getting them to switch the light bulb on as opposed to you sort of trying to bash it into their head, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Suman, you are on yeah. the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it kind of uh, pretty much in the statement itself sets the expectations of the coachee that this coaching is going to be very focused 
it's unlike any other coaching it will just help him or her to uh, you know get into the exponential space and uh, so the expectation is very well set so that's a lot more focused i like this thank you thank you it's just that you know coaching can be so many things and coaching is so useful in so many walks of life so many aspects of our lives right whether we have a problem with you know our work or the spouse or our kids or something completely different coaching can be super super powerful but i think we actually have an opportunity to create a whole new niche maybe a whole new industry actually uh, around EXO coaching uh, and actually bringing us even further down the road, not just coaching, uh, even though there are some excellent framework that can help us that comes from other types of coaching, but we can take this even further down that road uh, and add the exponential thinking, the exponential mindset with our EXO framework. And, uh, and I, I just find that so fascinating and, uh, and such a big opportunity and since you're on this call i just wanted hopefully to inspire you to to grab this and and go with it right try it out whenever you are coaching someone there and 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 see if this is of interest to your coachee uh, and learn from it and bring that learning back to us next time we're having calls like this which we have will have on an ongoing basis okay hey Lars. Uh, yeah. If I just may add to this, because that's something, this about thinking is something that I've, you know, <laughs> been thinking about. You do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, but understand me in that way, because, you know, often, and especially in our culture, we talk a little about thinking, you know, how, what do we think about so and so, but what we actually need yeah. is, you know, action or intention to act, right? So, so yeah. that's something that I at least have a, as an ambition not just to have people think about something because that's on a yeah. on a academic and intellectual level that's kind of you know inspiring to do some thinking and if so and so and what yeah. if so and so but what we actually need is some some action right um yeah. so, so i have the last um, few years try to you know uh, change my mindset in this so so this is about you know inspiring action and kind of you know so you really understand what change is needed and so you're not just thinking about it but you are actually doing something about it it's a very good point so the the action is important for any change to happen it's a requirement and this statement doesn't kind of suggest action as part of it mm -hmm. well I, I took that kind of for granted which is maybe diff which i shouldn't maybe uh if if you look at the the grow model right which is one of the most commonly used coaching models the the w is the will do you have the will to do it we just talked about the g that's your goal and o is your objective and a is the the different uh, uh the r is the you know the, the the results and the objectives and and then the will do you have the will to do this and then that's all about holding you accountable to your results so when you come back for another session with me, I'm going to ask you, and you know that, you know, so did you achieve your goals this week or this month? What did you achieve? And that's, that's the action. So, but it, it's definitely uh, without action, this doesn't really lead anywhere. Yeah. So it's a good point and maybe something to actually add explicitly into a definition that to exponential thinking and something else, uh, a word that indicates the action, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lars. Yeah. I have a question for you and for everybody else. Uh, taking this point about action, like how do we truly measure the success of a coaching? Like, okay, if you're coaching a person, that's one thing. If you're coaching a company, as most of us are doing in these sprints, how do, how, how do we measure? Like, okay, uh, six months later, the company really launched a project and this project really contributed for X percent of the total revenue that's really helped the company like getting back the money that they really pay us or in a personal level, someone that uh, wanted to, to change from, I don't know, from the uh, uh, financial 
department, move to the marketing department and, and, and really impact the organization. Like, because I, I think we can discuss as much as we want in terms of what's the definition, but I think the success has to be linked with the definition because otherwise it's just bubbles and bubbles and bubbles. So I, I, my question for you and, and for all, how do we measure this success? Because I think the, the definition needs to be attached with the measurement. That's, that's my point. So I want to hear from everybody. Emily, please. <laughs> You know, I think that there are some um, very obvious measures that might happen in terms of, you know, profitable new in, um, initiatives and things. But I think that the real measure actually comes when a company does actually experience disruption. And I think, um, you know, we just saw that with TD Ameritrade because two years ago when we started with them, we said your big risk is that um, trading fees are going to go to zero, as in your revenues are about to disappear. And two weeks ago, that actually happened. JP Morgan came out and said, we're going to do zero um, fee trades. And so the resilience and the ability to get through that is perhaps the biggest measure of, um, of, of what we do. I agree. But how many cases do we have besides Ameritrade? And how can we coach better not to take three years and take three months, six months? Because after all, we are selling exponential. Uh, 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 and not three years. Three years in, in our world is three decades, in my opinion. So how, how, how can we become better coaches? How can we become better so we can fast forward this process and not take three years and just three months or six months or one year? Yeah. So, so my, my staff at this, and then we can uh, you know, hear um, other experiences, other uh, ways of actually measuring coaching but for, to me, it's very important that before you begin a coaching journey with a client, whether it's for a few weeks or a few months or years, that you, that you agree on what, what are the goals that you want to achieve. I'm here as your coach on that journey, but what are your goals? What do you want to achieve within a certain time frame? And as long as everybody agrees, those are probably realistic goals, we could probably achieve this, then that's what you're measuring your coaching up against, your results up against. Did your coach did actually achieve uh, their plan? Did they uh, succeed with their plan and the implementation of it within a, a certain time frame? And, and this could, in, in, our, in, in our world of uh, exponential sprints, one example very often, um, is to measure the number of experiments running at any given time in an organization, simply because experimentation is so critical to innovation. So, and typically organizations do very little experimentation. It's mainly operational activities that get the money and time and the resources. But experimentation is usually uh, on a low priority. It should be a high priority. So it's one of the metrics that we we often recommend an organization uh we say so this should be one of your one of your goals one of your um okrs or kpis you should measure how many experiments you run per week or per month how many new initiatives you launch per week per month and 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 that is something tangible that you can can measure if your coaching led to this you have succeeded and an experiment can be launched in half an hour from now if we want to, right? So it doesn't have to take three years. It's just if you, if you build a new behavior in, in a team or in an organization, a behavior that drives experimentation, uh, that's a big success in, in our world. There are many, many other metrics and examples, um, but this is just one of them. But I wanted to open up if, if there are other experiences um, on how do you measure success uh, in your coaching? Lars? Yes, Jabin. Jabin. Um, I guess <clears throat> in some sense, I would have a little trouble distinguishing what are the actual results of the EXO Sprint methodology itself versus the coaching. And I, I know the coaching is a huge part of it. And, and what is... Uh, 
a function of the effectiveness or the impact of the team or individuals within the team. So the metrics, the results that come out of the initiatives that get funded, et cetera, are those measures of success of the coaching, of the process, of the teams? Um, I think there needs to be a little bit of differentiation and possibly for the coaches, the biggest measure would be the personal feedback from the individuals and the teams that were being coached. Because, I mean, none of their initiatives might be result in any uh, tangible results, but they might say, the coaching was amazing. I have just shifted my mindset. I'm just a different person now. So can you comment on that? A absolutely. I'd also like to take um, thoughts from anyone else that sees, maybe some of you see it from a different perspective or, or from a distance or closer. But so um, to me, to me, the coaching approach and the outcome that we commit to deliver as, as if you like a service provider, uh, they're very, um, they're very, it's very hard to separate them from each other. Uh, obviously we are applying a, a coaching approach on our delivery. The delivery model is very much coaching focused. Um, but, and, uh, and your goals, some, sometimes the key goal for a client is not necessarily the initiatives and it never should be, it should not be the initiatives themselves that get presented after 10 weeks because they keep evolving, they keep changing. Some of them, many of them will die off. It, it is about the change of mindset, the change of our behaviors in, in our organizations. I think that's what we see, that's the key goal for most of our clients, pretty much all of them. They're saying, we want to change our culture. We want to change the way we behave in our organizations. We need to say yes more and not no all the time and these things. Uh, so, so, and the coaching uh, is, is the approach that allows us to change behaviors. The, the coaching itself doesn't tell you which initiative to launch. It, it just impacts the way we think individually then how we think as a team and that then leads to to hopefully better initiatives more exponential initiatives and other outcomes new skill sets acquired and so on <clears throat> but you could you yep. could also see the coaching as as a standalone separately isolated and 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 talk about what's when is that good coaching what's the outcome from that particular coaching how do you measure that and, and it, it's easier at an individual level. You will always have different team members that have different opinions. Some, most are usually very happy about the coaching they receive from you guys, right? Some are super excited. And then once every three years, there's one that, who's unhappy about something, which is usually not the coaching, it's usually something else. So how do you measure? Do you take an average of that feedback? I don't know. I, 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 I'd prefer as a coach to take individual feedback from anyone that I have been coaching and learn from that, right? And, and, and accept that feedback, listen to it and, and, and learn from it. And, and, and we, we, we try to do that also at a service delivery level, of course, because we need to learn and share those, whatever are the best practices, whatever people seem to appreciate as part of the coaching. And, uh, and we are trying to write a book about it, but it's super hard, right? Because it's, it's very individual, what you want to get out of it. It's very much down to what is, the, what is my culture also. Some cultures are more open to personal learning than others. And there are many, many um, barriers on that journey. So I don't know if there's one answer. Other thoughts so, or comments? Yeah, I, so I, I agreeing fully with you, Lars, on the fact of the, the mindset and, and maybe not the fact that certain initiatives were, were started. I think it is important to measure the fact that initiatives are being proposed. So uh, in a period of over two years after they've gone through this, that the number of initiatives, whatever they are, 
are being pushed through because that's the proof that the mindset has changed. Because just to say a mindset has changed, who knows? I mean, like you said, some people might think, yes, our company mindset has changed. And other people would say, no, it's just still the same. But the proof yeah. is in the pudding when, when they actually start seeing initiatives, whatever they are coming through the pipeline. Yeah. And I think it's possible to have a successful coaching outcome for the individuals on the teams, but not a successful outcome uh, long term for the company. Yeah. So we have and to be we, careful about the depth, who we're talking about with the successful outcome. Yeah, and that, that was kind of my original point. I mean, there may be a yeah. successful outcome for for the the sprint itself in terms of the number of initiatives funded, et cetera. I, I'm not sure how what those tangible metrics are if you have a standard set of metrics but the coaching itself the metrics for the success of the coaching itself i think is a little bit different it, it's it's very different but let, let me just give you so emily gave some good examples on uh, for, for tda where where actually uh, this made a big difference for for tda they saw this coming very early on um we have obviously the the early sprints that we did uh, are now starting to uh, generate results. They're probably the, the the best case studies because they're the ones that had most time to implement and to actually go to market. Um, but recently, there was uh, were two new startups launched by Stanley Black and Decker that came out of the first EXO sprint. They actually incorporated businesses now with quite quite interesting teams uh, and <clears throat> and videos explaining what they do uh, so there are new companies coming out of this and I, I just want to say uh, that uh, on that on that journey from ideation to implementation one of the one of the criteria to achieve success with coaching is that the same people stay on board um, and, and some of the people that are now working in new startups, that, uh, they, had, they have originally been part of creating the idea, coming up with the idea, and validating that idea, and, and building the prototype. Now they have launched the companies, which is an exceptional outcome uh, in so many ways. But we also see the opposite. Uh, we also have a client that right now is struggling because they replaced the whole sprint team with new people and, and gave them a job to do and say, hey, go build this, right? And those people who took took the ideas had no interest really or no, no really passion for those initiatives. And they are struggling to, to build motivation in the team. And I don't understand why that is a big surprise, but we see this challenge, right? And we have to keep reminding our client, hey guys, Coaching is something that that is an ongoing investment. Actually, you need to build your own internal coaching capabilities, uh, and and you need to keep working. You need to keep same the same people in the teams, at least some of them, uh, because you've been building um, a change of mindset over time through the coaching. You see people change. You see better results coming as a as an outcome of that. And then if you change those teams, replace them entirely and make it entirely operational, um, you lose that momentum, you lose the mindset, you lose the knowledge about the methodology, you lose everything. So, and, and this is, you know, so success in, in the coaching process, in my opinion, depends very much also on the actions of the client. And, and it's our duty to advise them on, on this and it's also up to the client to try to follow that advice. Uh, so there, there are many, many aspects to this. Yeah, just, sir. Yeah, Sonia, just want to add just a word of <clears throat> caution because I have seen whenever you, you fix a very hard, you know, measures like the number of experiments that are being run. So the companies or the individuals should be very, you know, it's very easy to game the system. You can float n number of experiments being run. That doesn't mean anything. I think on the yeah. contrary, what is important is it is what you do when no one is watching you. For example, how is the literature or the ecosystem supporting failures? 
Are the leaders still asking for business cases and approvals, as an example, and so on and so forth? So some of these behavioral merits of the uh, ecosystem in the enterprise, I think if there is a measure, if there is a way we can measure some of those things, uh, supporting failure, supporting success, supporting resources, asking for business case approvals and so on and so forth, and to what extent some of the bold ideas they are. Uh, I mean, if there is any, any, uh, I know it, it's not an easy measure, but if there is some method in the madness to put a handle on that, I think we should be able to say that, yes, our coaching has been effective to uh, make an amend on the culture, which in itself will go a long way to, you know, uh, get the results that what we are looking for as an exo coach. Um, I would like to add a few comments here. Um, first of all, I think what we see having the exo methodology is a very strong and effective method for, for changing the practice and the habits in the organization to how you deal with experimentation and understanding of digitalization and outside change and so on. So, so that leads me to, to um, in my world, there are two kind of levels to what we're doing. First of all, is this, this that we deal with the organization. We have processes, we, uh, we, we, create some new habits within the organization and, and create a new language there. But there's also a more personal aspect. And I think we all see that and maybe also experience it uh, on our own body. I have at least is this uh, fear and anxiousness that it comes to actually doing some changes, right? So, so it may be that we kind of see that uh, uh, there'll be a, a no cost uh, trading, uh, but you know, what, what does it take to actually do some radical or some some brave decisions in the organization to to make those changes come through. And you know, one thing is about you know talking about it and thinking about it in the session. But the other thing is actually to have the managers or the project leaders to to kind of deal with this fear and anxiousness and and go ahead and do it. Right. Um, and I think we can all say exactly at what point in the process this happened where you see this fear and anxious coming up. So it's, it's just something that a person is quite aware of this. When does this happen and, and how can we address it? And I haven't nailed it yet, uh, but it's something that I am find extremely interesting and, and it's my ambition to kind of master that specific uh, issue uh, when we do the coaching, right? Also very interesting point. Just back to Suran's but also good good point on how how do we measure measure this. so there are actually some interesting tools and 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 peter uh, on this call and i have been and i owe peter uh, to come back to him on this but we're looking into organizational network analysis and there are some interesting tools that helps to measure how individuals behave on a daily basis and behave meaning how 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 do we interact with other people around us or uh, digitally during a day do we work alone isolated do we hang out by the water cooler and talk to everyone and, and also who do we talk with and and to some extent also about what if it's work related so and then this is there are some uh, tools that we want to test out actually that first of all, it helps us to establish a baseline. Uh, what is our behavior as an organization before doing anything, right? Because maybe we're doing really well, maybe we're doing really poorly, but we cannot really measure any change unless we know where we came from. Then, then and, and it includes different devices that measures our activities over a day. Um, and then, then we, uh, on an ongoing basis, hopefully, we'll see, uh, can measure how we change behavior, how we work differently, not how we think differently, but the actual activities that we, that we do, that can be measured to, at least to some extent. And, and this is something we wanna experiment with and, and see if we can actually measure something that helps us to, uh, to document I 
think we lost Lars again. Yes. <laughs> Let's wait some seconds and hope he will be back. <laughs> People in Africa always complain about internet. So this makes me laugh so much on the inside. I was, just, I was on a call with people in the States and they were the ones having the internet issues. I was like, ah, oh, so maybe, great. <laughs> maybe Lars is also, is also in Africa. I don't know, yeah, maybe he's in Nigeria. Uh, <laughs> I, I think he's he back <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say if we have magic that can uh, take the fear away and then I had no Wi-Fi so <laughs> that was the magic I had but but that actually I, I think it's not about taking the fear away it's about helping us to live with the fear more than more than anything I, 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 I like the term about learning to surf your fear surfing your fear right a bit big because the fear will always be there. We we don't know our future. We just need to create it uh, and, and live with whatever anxiety and fear. But 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 we can we can help a lot uh, as as coaches um, and mitigate that fear and 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 minimize it in so many ways. I think if it's just like stress i think if we feel that we're not on top of things uh we get stressed but if we feel we're doing the best we can we're on track on the plan we put together st the stress goes away hopefully and i think that the coaching can can help us to to uh, find out if we are on track uh and are we on track on the plan that we have presented to our coach in the past uh, so this is something we can do to help us uh, serve our fear. Awesome. Well, Lars, uh, yeah. um, you mentioned the word, uh, well, the, the concept of uh, creating a baseline to measure your progress mm -hmm. and performance from, um, which I think is a, a great thing if we know what the metrics are that we're trying to measure. Um, yeah. do, do we promote the concept of benchmarking of companies within an industry against uh, against each other also to show how they're shifting and progressing it we have, we have not um, so far on, on our journey mm -hmm. I, I want I, I want to find out if it's relevant I mean I come from an industry I, I worked for some years for, for Gartner the IT analysis company that is all about benchmarking, right? Benchmarking everything, everything that can be measured. And uh, so, so, but, but how, how do you, if you, if you take, um, a, if you take a caterpillar and transform it into a, a butterfly, right? What, what are those metrics and how do you compare that transformation to others? that may transform from, I don't know, something else into something completely different. How, how do you compare those things? I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. have the answers to that. Maybe we might leverage on the exponential quotient we already have. So it's, 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 a, it's a measure, or at least we think it's a measure because it contains numbers. And if the exponential quotient is higher of one company, then we think that it's more exponential than the other with a lower <laughs> score. But we already yeah, have we already have one <laughs> yeah, yeah i guess the, the exq could be used for both baselining and benchmarking it's, it's pretty good we're actually there's a new exq running in south africa uh with kevin uh and we've revised it slightly or the foundation has revised it slightly so it's out of 100 now instead of out of 84 so it's a little easier to understand uh but we're about to rank um with Kevin's help and a company he connected us with in South Africa, the top 100 companies in South Africa with the EXQ. So we'll be Great reviving, be. reviving the, the EXQ studies again. Awesome. Th thank you very much. Uh, that's interesting. I, I, I hope to hear a lot more about that. And I, I agree that our EXQ is definitely both tangible and, and, and useful. Uh, so, and we, we have uh, actually had many discussions in the past about, you know, could we repeat an EXQ survey? We already do it in the beginning of a sprint, but, 
but can we do it again? Uh, we know for edge initiatives, uh, it, it probably should be done a couple of years after a sprint. So now it's about time to do it for some of the first initiatives that, that we're helping create for a core organization, maybe right after the sprint. Uh, but we, we haven't uh, done it, but it, it, it's uh, very, very interesting to figure out the best benchmark transformation up against industry. Lars, I have a yes. question. Oh, I'm sorry, you first, Emily, please. No, no, please go ahead. No, I just, I was just wondering, do we need to add some kind of a culture element? Because I'm from Brazil. I work most of my time in Latin America. I live now in the U.S. I'm also working for U.S. companies. It's completely different worlds, completely different mindsets, completely different expectations. Like the expectation that companies have from Brazil, from Mexico are completely different. Uh, the level of acceptance for failure is also different. The American uh, economy is now boosting. So if you want to go to a, a company right now in the U.S., hey, uh, I'm going to help you to innovate. Their level of acceptance is very high because probably their, their, their revenues are, are, are now steady or growing. Uh, different from companies from other parts of the world. So I think we need to have some kind of a culture el element because there are, uh, you know, cultures that are, are more um, acceptance for failure. There are others that are less. Uh, uh, also, we need to respect the uh, economic momentum that the country or the region is facing. So I think we need to add more variables on this equation because just to uh, measure yeah. in terms of uh, how many uh, new projects are coming into the pipeline or uh, how many new projects are just uh, being released. I think it's a very binary way of measuring success. And I think we need to add the culture element to that. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, having worked in Spain for 30 years and also, you know, been in, Can in Canada for for almost that amount of time, it's so different. And then you go to South America and it's different again. And I don't even know what Asia is like, but I'm sure <laughs> they're quite different too. So it, there has to be some, this has to be addressed somehow because it is, it is quite different in different places. So it has to be approached that way. May I jump in and say, I, I think we're also missing an element of MTP here. If a company starts out by um, defining an MTP, then we need to be measuring them against that. How many lives have you positively affected with what you're doing compared to the baseline status quo? It should be a default um, metric, really, yeah, for any, any activity we do. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. I, I, I just, I, I, I just agree also about the cultural element very much. Uh, having lived in 12 different countries in many continents now, but, I, I, but it's more than that also. It's, it's not that a team in China necessarily is radically different from a team in Brazil or vice versa. It, it, you, it depends really on 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 the people in the team of course and the organization uh, so so the cultural aspect absolutely uh, but i think you measure um you measure the cultural differentiator by the people who are in the team that you are coaching and and some of us have been uh, had a lot of exposure to other cultures and uh, so people adapt very quickly and they understand uh, what's going on and they and so on and others have had no or little international exposure and and then the culture local culture is much stronger has a, a, a stronger factor of, of influence on them on their decisions so it's um, we definitely need to adjust for, for culture um, but in a way that that kind of takes into account that some people actually uh, don't need, uh, don't need uh, to adjust. So they, they have been around the world and they have seen a little bit of everything. So, so you don't need to adjust for culture in some cases. So 
very interesting. And totally to Emily's point, the MTP, yes, how many people have you impacted uh, positively? That should be uh, in, in every uh, a goal for every coaching session, really. Awesome. Yes. Is there a possibility to add one more point? I, yes. I, I think monetary is also important because if the client feels that it's something good is happening to, uh, to him or her, then it comes back to us and uh, repeats uh, uh, buying. So it's also important. I, I think not not the only one, but also an important aspect. And Absolutely. Again, and pays for the service, re regardless we are EXO or individual coaches. To totally agree. <laughs> agree. Yeah. I wanna um, I, I wanna just um, show a little bit about uh, before we wrap up for for today. But I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about core coaching competencies, and uh, I found these in some very good books. I just want to share it with everyone. I, I, from what I hear, <laughs> I think everybody will, will accept um, that these are core coaching competencies. I will share this with you after, after the call, right? I, I think this could be a nice way to close the session for today. And then also I want to talk about um, topics that you guys would like to discuss on some of the next calls that we will be doing because we'll keep doing these calls for as long as anybody wants them. So let me just, before we, we dive into next meetings, just take you through core coaching competences. And, um, and here are here are some of them. And uh, the first one is empathy. And, uh, and I, 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 I sense that from all of you clearly, uh, you're very strong on empathy. And, and so is our clients, right? And that, that makes a very open and, and honest uh, and understanding intervention. Uh, so people really want to help. And uh, also want to come back and say, thank you. Uh, you have been a big part of this. And this is so rewarding, actually, when you uh, have the, the, you're bold enough to show your empathy, which you have uh, by nature it's rewarding and it pays back very quickly. Uh, so uh, definitely a core competence is intuition. This can, this can always be fun to discuss, right? But I, according to, to all the good books out there, I, this is a core competence and I agree. Um, so in, intuition plays a role in this. Uh, we, we're not diving into the discussion today, but but uh, but it, it plays a role what what you by intuition feel about and what I'm trying to do. Humility is is very important. And I, I think basically it comes down to that we learn uh, that there's so much we don't know, right? And we don't know what we don't know. So if we, there's no point in th considering ourselves a master of anything because most of the knowledge out there is something we don't know. So I think that gives us a natural humility when we realize that. Um, and, and clients really appreciate that. They don't want the miss I know everything. Really, a coach is something, someone who's open to consider other opinions and other perspectives and discuss that. And it's someone with a certain level of humi humility and the growth mindset, which everybody in our ecosystem have, uh, I mean, big time. And, and it really comes from always stepping outside of our comfort zone and always being open to learn and always seeking personal learning and personal growth, right? And, and this, is, this is very, very essential. Um, all right. So those was, were just um, a few slides on core coaching competencies. If you find that interesting, I'm more than happy to, to share that. So, in closing here for today, um, I encourage you to keep iterating uh, your definitions of successful coaching. I think you nailed it, all of you. 
I, I, I totally agree with all your perspectives here. I, I liked everything I heard. And, uh, and sell your story. I think coaching is so important and so valuable and so underutilized around the world. So if we believe in coaching, we are the ones who should go out and sell the idea of coaching. Not necessarily for us to make uh, a living out of it, but because everybody should acquire skill sets internally uh, on coaching, in my opinion. Um, I wanted also to bring up an opportunity to discuss real life coaching challenges or best practices that you guys have. And I think we can do that in about five minutes before we have to wrap up. But I wanted to make sure first to discuss topics that you could be interested in discussing on some of the coming calls. Any topic is welcome as long as it's related to coaching one way or another, right? even, even remotely. So any topic that, that anyone would like to propose for coming calls? May I please? please. <laughs> so one of the things I love about this call is that it's um, some people who've done a lot of EXO work, but also some really new faces. And I would love to hear some case studies from the new people. Um, you know, what has really worked for you in the past in terms of coaching? Uh, what would you avoid and how are you going to add the EXO element to what you're already um, brilliant at doing? Thanks. That, that could easily be uh, a dedicated call on, on, on that particular agenda. Uh, we can also try to cover it uh, before we wrap up. If anybody on the call feels that they match uh, this, this profile and have an interesting story to tell, <clears throat> think about it while I'm writing it down. And then let's, let just, uh, let's hear any other input to agendas for coming calls. Oh, I, think I, can. I, I, I want to jump in and say something about, you know, um, I see a lot of coaches getting sucked into doing the work for the teams at times. And the teams are somehow able to get the coach to actually do the work for them. It's a pitfall. Right. So, so, so the question could be how to avoid that, how to avoid getting getting involved in yes yeah okay yeah and and sort of re related to that question uh, might be how to manage the, the the group dynamics because a lot of times what happens is that they're you know they're wanting other people to do it and nobody do it and nobody does it and so they, it, the coach does end up doing that sometimes so maybe i don't know well, i think it's sort of related but anyway that's another idea mm. De definitely. Both group dynamics and how to avoid getting stuck in the client's work are super, super interesting, super relevant to discuss. I, I just, you know, I recently, um, I, I, I was, you know, visiting a, a sprint delivery, a workshop, and one of the coaches was exhausted after, uh, after the day was over. And I had seen this coach again and again and again, kind of, facilitating everything nonstop, right? And writing on the canvases and doing everything for the team. Obviously, that's how to get exhausted. <laughs> it wasn't the point of, of, of the workshop to, that it should work out that way. So, and it's very easy to get uh, absorbed. Also because we build relations during a sprint and we also get interested in the projects, right? It, it is interesting work. So. How do we avoid that? I'll put that on the agenda for another call and managing group dynamics as well. Absolutely. Other, other topics that we should dive into next time or on another call? Uh, any live case uh, that we have in the Exo Liver and someone could narrate that experience also, uh, that would actually give us a first-hand experience of how the EX mm -hmm. coaching was a little different from the conventional coaching and a journey to a life case would be relevant perhaps. Very, very good. Um, 
very good thing to ask for. Thank you very much. I, I, we have also on this call actually many who could who could deliver that those experiences, and we'll do that. We'll set aside a call to discuss these uh, real experiences from past sprints. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Any any other topics before we uh, hit the top of the hour and I have to run off then? <clears throat> We, we've been uh, covering a lot here. Um, so I, I'm going to plan the coming meetings. There's one again on Tuesday. It's going to be focused on the same topic, the same questions as of today. I'm sure the discussion may run in different directions. I, that would be interesting. You're welcome to join again if you feel like it. Uh, but then also keep looking out in our uh, circle in Lever. Uh, to look for the next invitations and I'll make sure to build a plan of new calls where we touch on all these different topics and I'll reach out to many of you to also to get you involved in presenting your learnings and your experiences from and blasts from the past uh, and that's going to be uh, a great learning for all of us. So I'm, I'm going to say thank you so much for your, for your time uh, I hope you enjoy uh, this kind of interaction now that we cannot be together in person over drinks or anything else, but we can at least do this. And I hope you have enjoyed it. Any, any last minute uh, feedback or thoughts on how we can do it um, better next time? And I'll, I'll be more than happy to yeah. get feedback. It was, a great, it, was a, it was a great session. Thanks, Lars. Yes. Better internet Great connection, team. Lars. Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> Just say. Just say. You just mixed yourself. It's going to be you next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I'll work on the Wi Fi. I need to find another office, I guess. <laughs> Bye, thank everybody. you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, guys. Have a Take great care. Day. Bye. Thank Bye. you all. Bye.